Neil, is this typical of uh, today? Is that is that what's going on? Well, it's not typical today so much because what you have a lot of now is uh, what's called um, well, they they pay fees when you want to build a property and you come to a, a zoning board. They're going to they have what's called an impact fee. So you're going to build a, you're going to build a thousand houses. We're going to expect you to pay to widen the road to fulfill the need that that thousand houses is going to require. You're going to have to dedicate a police station because we can't have a thousand new houses and not have a police station or a fire station or something like that. You're going to put up them. There's two possibilities. If it's going to be on their property, they can build it themselves and then turn it over to the municipality. If it's going to be on a different property, they have to pay the fee because obviously you can't build on somebody else's land. So, the law has been changing, and I'm sure you've heard of some of these, these rules. AB 857, passed in 2002, the California Environmental Quality Act. You have to analyze global warming, environmental impacts, and establish the state planning priorities for growth and development, including promoting developed areas with existing infrastructure in order to reduce vehicle miles traveled and protecting agricultural land. The biggest thing about sprawl is what it does, is it creates vehicle miles. And what do vehicles do? They create greenhouse gases. So if you build inside the existing infrastructure, not only are there no impact fees, because you already have the sewers, you already have the police stations, you already have the schools, but you're, you're not causing people to drive out. We, have, we live in an environment, you know, you've all gone to Lancaster and Palmdale, you see the rows and rows of houses. What we live in, in our, our, in our auto-centric environment is that you drive until you qualify. You know, people, they, they work in the city, they want to own that, Ameri that so-called American dream, the house with the little white picket fence. They drive, they just keep going until they qualify for a loan. And then, but what they don't do is they don't account for the cost of the travel. They don't account for that 21% of their budget or more going into having to get to work every day. Mm -hmm. You know, and with gas going up to four fifty five dollars a gallon, people can't afford to get to work. <laughs> and what happens is, and and you'll actually you've probably seen places like Riverside have been hit the worst by the mortgage crisis. They have thousands of empty houses out there. Uh, obviously, part of that is people being upside down on the houses, but a big part of that is they lose their jobs. They can't pay for the house. Well, at that point, obviously, they're not driving to work, but people need to find, people need to be able to get to work is the key, the key issue. I have a question. You talked oh, about a minute ago about if you're building in a general area where the infrastructure is there, you don't have a number of these fees to collect. What about the people who are tearing down triplexes and putting up 10 and 20 unit apartment buildings or 20 unit? Uh, it depends. Condos, because now you are impacting the infrastructure because you're adding residents to that same area. It depends. It depends on what, what the infrastructure is capable of handling. If you're going to add, if you're going to tear down a, 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 you know, a, a housing development for three, for three households, and put in a housing development for 25, there may be burdens that need to be dealt with, and you'll be responsible for those things. But typically, inner city, those those. Those, those urban uh, infrastructures are built out to accommodate a lot. Uh, and, and you're only required by law to put in, to put in uh, you know, your share, you know, if, you're, if you're going beyond the power of the road to Hamlet, for instance. So, you know, like I said, you're putting in a thousand houses and the, road, the road's a two-lane highway. Well, maybe I need a four-lane highway now and it's your responsibility to make sure that the road can handle your traffic. Um, do you see what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to give you some more details. We'll get back to that. Uh, ah, California Strategic Growth Plan mandates state investments in infrastructure to plan growth for not priority areas. Uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of AB 32. We had that uh, vote in November uh, that uh, with regards to AB 32, <coughs> forcible limits on greenhouse gases. Transportation Planning and Sustainable Communities Strategy Act, SB 375, mandating, mandating regional transportation and land use plans and strategic growth plans for emissions reductions. The state 
is coming down on the local communities, the local municipalities, and the counties, and saying, you shall do this. So when we talk about sprawl versus smart growth, it's not whether you, whether you don't get to choose. It's not a question of choosing anymore. <coughs> sprawl isn't going to be allowed. You're not going to be able to justify it under the law. And you're not going to be able, you, you're not, it's just not going to happen. We're moving past it now. Okay, a couple of other things. Safe, Accountable, Flexible, Efficient Transportation Equity Act. Safety. <laughs> yeah, I know. Federal law. If you want to get federal money for transportation, you have to have an MPO, Metropolitan Planning, an MPO, a Metropolitan Planning Organization, for regional transportation and land use planning. They are in Clean Air Act. You are not going to get any federal funds as a local as a local municipality if you for your for your community if you don't do these things if you don't clean up how you how how things are working if you don't clean up your sprawl if you don't come up with alternative solutions it requires all federally funded road projects to be consistent with the transportation and land use plan so you can't just come to this to the federal government and say here's my road plan because what they're going to do is they're going to take a look at the regional plan and they're going to say, sorry, it doesn't comply. Here's proposed federal energy and climate legislation. American Clean Energy and Security Act requires MPOs to update transportation, again, to reduce vehicle miles traveled and trips to meet greenhouse gas emissions. So you've got the state coming from one side, you've got the feds coming from the other side. The future is here. The future is not sprawl. The future is how do we limit the travel time, how do we minimize the greenhouse gases, and how to create livable environments under those, under those rules. <coughs> so maybe some of you have heard of this organization, it's called SCAG, Southern California Area Government, and it is five <coughs> counties of Southern California, LA, Orange, Ventura, Riverside, and San Bernardino counties. It is the, what we call the local, it's the local regional organization for all the municipalities and counties within that five county limit. And there are, I think there are 13 statewide. There's a Bay Area version of SCAG, there's, there's you know, there's a San Diego version of SCAG, they're, they're all over the state. Uh, federally funded transportation projects, like I said, it's all about vehicle travel being minimized, so how are they going to prioritize their money? City centers, metro centers and city centers come first, rail transit second, buses, um, buses third, airports and industrial centers and ports, priority residential infill areas, and last, new towns, new trans tra traditional neighborhood developments, the kinds of things that are going to be on, anything that's on the outskirts is either going to not get any money or is going to be the last to get money when everybody else has gotten a piece of the pie. God, what would be considered outskirts around here anymore? I mean, we're full everywhere. <laughs> well, that may be here, but most kind of parts of the country is it's a little more true. Okay. black letter. Um, yeah, let's move forward. Okay, so when we're talking about sustainability, what are we talking about? <coughs> Sustainable development means the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations. But it doesn't mean it doesn't mean stopping growth. What it really means it's about creating growth and business and jobs, but without the waste and expense of sprawl. Um, there's some interesting information. Historical statistics show that repair work on roads and bridges generates 16% more jobs per dollar than new bridges and road construction. Right now, in this economic environment, we shouldn't be building new roads, building new bridges. We should be fixing the ones we have. They create more jobs. Also, repair and maintenance projects spend money faster and create jobs more quickly than building new roads. They employ more kinds of workers, spend much less money on land and more on wages, spend less time on plans and permits. Investment in, also, investment in public transportation generates 31% more jobs per dollar than new construction on roads and bridges. Does anybody do studies of like if this bridge collapses or this whatever, it's going to cost you X. 
I mean, it seems like the money. You mean beyond the actual repair or the replacement beyond, I mean, it's the, like, the bridge? It, it, how much does it cost you to have to drive 10 miles around to get to the next Well, bridge? I mean, it's just, it's like, oh, we need to put $10 billion into some foreign adventure or whatever, and we can't afford to build that bridge. It's, are there studies that say, well, that thing's going to collapse in 10 years, and if it does, it's going to, everybody's going to have to drive an extra 10 miles to get somewhere, and it's going to cost X. I mean, I haven't seen that study. That's not to say someone has money. <laughs> Actually, this morning on uh, the radio story about uh, our gas, uh, natural gas infrastructure, and how in different places it's going to start exploding and just killing masses, mass amounts of people on an occasional basis. And uh, um. it's just, it's just, it's I'm looking forward to it. It's just, it's just how it's too expensive for the company to go in and test everything, and they just have to, you know, they test a little bit here and there, but it's way too expensive, and they're just not going to bother. And, there's going to be some, some catastrophes every once in a while. And, and on, on that point, uh, Mark, I heard, I think it was yesterday on the radio, they were talking about, uh, was it uh, that town in the Bay Area where they had that explode, that gas explosion? <laughs> and they were talking about um, that pipe was put in 50 years ago. And uh, now they're talking about requiring these companies to do hydrostatic testing of all these pipes. And they also pointed out that that cost about five hundred thousand dollars per mile. What? So that's, that's why. You're do it. <laughs> so no one's real excited about having to do that testing. But on the other hand, well, you have, and those are pretty recent pipes. Those are the fifties, not right. the ones from the thirties and the twenties. And uh, but I mean, every every infrastructure must have an end of life. Well, um, there's no way, this. My understanding, if you want to, we're getting a little specific. But my understanding from listening again from radio programs is that that pipe. Had been, that area had been slated for replacement two or three years ago. In fact, they got the uh, uh, was it PG&E went to um, the PUC to get uh, a boost in their rates so they could do the pipe replacements. And they took their boost and they never actually did the right pipe replacement, as you can tell. Of uh, but when we, they're 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 expecting spectacular accidents like that all over. There have been a few around the country and there are going to be more. Uh, there was an article in the LA Times the other day about um, about this country, the, the, uh, the dams in this country. Uh, that most of them are, if not on the verge of collapse, are expected to, that in case of uh, flooding or in case of um, earthquake, are expected to fail. Uh, there's a dam above San, San Bernardino um, that if it, they keep the the, uh, the um, Army Corps of Engineers keeps that dam only two thirds full, they're constantly running water out of it because they expect that because it turns out that, the, that it's it was built on an active fault, which at the time they built it, they knew the fault was there, but they didn't think it was active. Um, and uh, if that dam breaks, the city of San Bernardino will become the 30 feet of water. Yeah. So, uh, you know, at the San Diego, San Bernardino, bring a surfboard. I got a question about <coughs> said the uh, repair of infrastructure brings more jobs. It's not the same thing. It costs a lot more. No, because when you build new, you have to buy the land that didn't own that you didn't own before, mm -hmm. and you're not buying land when you are repairing what you already own. And land is expensive. <clears throat> Got a question on that same line. That that statement does that include the secondary, I guess, value of if you fix existing infrastructure, then you're creating, you're allowing more people to be more productive as far as reducing travel time and all that kind of stuff too, or that's just straight jobs for creating fixing infrastructure. I don't know. 